So the brief for the workshop was to do a similar painting to the deers that I did some time back, um, standing in like a forest or woodland area. But this time we're going to be doing it in the city. So we're going to have like uh, neon signs and like uh, light pollution, all that kind of stuff. So these are the four sketches that I sent over. Different animals in different city scenarios. My favourite was the buffalo. I quite like the composition and uh, so did the guys over at Imagine Effects, so we decided to go with that one. Unfortunately, I didn't record the sketch process for these, but I, I redrew it and sketched it up again just so you can see the process that I went through. This is probably one of the fastest stages to the painting, but it's going to be the most important. Um, I duplicate my window and I use that as my thumbnail. So if you go to Window, Arrange, and then go down to New Window for uh, whatever file you've saved your name as, um, and I put that either to the side or on a secondary screen, and I'm essentially painting from that thumbnail. I'm always keeping my eye on it to make sure that it reads. So I get my values in as close as I can. Um, and keep my attention to the thumbnail. Once I know it reads on a small scale and the composition's where I want it to be, I know that it's going to work further down the line on a larger scale. After you've got this first stage right, it's essentially just colorizing and rendering out. But all the hard work will have already been done. My document is set up to 150 pixels per inch for the resolution. That just helps with these larger brushes, so the document doesn't lag. But I will definitely uh, upscale it before I take through to final. Maybe just after the sketch is done uh, is an appropriate time to, to do this, or after the colorizing. Um, yeah, so I have block filled the background in, um, quite dark with it being a nighttime scene. Then added the atmospherics in the, the mid-ground, which will act from the neon signs and then silhouetted the foreground buildings. I like to try and get a good balance of large, medium and small shapes for the composition. So in this instance we've got the foreground buildings acting as the large shapes, then the buildings in the background as the medium shapes. Potentially the buffalo is a medium shape, but then you have like small lights in the windows, the plant trail from the buffalo, the neon signs, all those will act as these small shapes. I like to work in that order as well. I like to get the biggest shapes down first, then work to the smaller shapes. In regards to values, I, I do try and avoid using black and white as much as I can help it. I like to, uh, I like to reserve the right to use the black or white for when I really need it. So in this case, I will probably go for the buffalo is going to have the most brightest value. Um, I don't believe that you shouldn't ever use black or white, but I feel like they should be used sparingly. I have a reference up for this buffalo, um, and I'm just going to try and get the silhouette down first, sketch out the outline before going block filling it in. With it being in black and white, I will fill it with a, a lightish grey. Had I been doing this in colour, then I would have probably done it in a low opacity and let some of those colours come through, but fortunately I don't have to do that. But once I have the buffalo filled, I will start going around the edges with white and begin making it look as though it's translucent. The idea is the buffalo is going to be see-through and also self-illuminating. So if you imagine the contours of the buffalo wrapping around on itself, you're going to be kind of doubling up on the, the surface areas. So if it's self-illuminating, then it's going to be even brighter. And that's the general idea that I'm going to go for. So through the center of the buffalo, it's going to have more space.
I want this buffalo to really glow. So to give it more illumination, I just take the soft brush and just dab over the top and let that light seep into the environment more. For the ground, I take the lasso tool and just create a few puddle shapes, add highlights, and then streak down the light below the, the buffalo's feet just to give the illusion that the floor is wet and it's reflecting, reflecting the buffalo below. I want the buildings to also feel like they're being lived in, like there's some life. So I'm just going to sketch in, imply the idea that there's like little clotheslines from one side to the other just connecting the two and breaking up that space as well. Essentially the sketch is pretty much finished. Uh, I'm just adding a few small details and any areas that I think are too plain or any edges that I think are too clean I'm just adding a few uh, variations just to break it up but other than that it's it's pretty much there and ready to take through to colorizing so that's it uh, it didn't take very long and uh, it's kind of messy but all the values are there that I need compositions where I want it to be so from this point on, I'd be happy to start adding colour. Of course, I already have my sketch prepared from before, um, which is very similar, and we'll start colourising it up. There's kind of endless possibilities when it comes to colourising an image. My usual go-to that you can see now is the gradient map. So I'm choosing a dark purple colour for the shadows, and then for the highlights I'm using blue. And that really only touches the the neon and the buffalo uh, but alongside this I I love the color layer so on a new layer with the color blending mode I chose pink and started throwing it down onto the onto the areas that the neon signs are going to be with a mix of blue which you can see now but the majority the majority is going to be pink so this way I can have a contrast in the hue between the neon and the blue from the buffalo. So I'm adding blue now to the buffalo on a hard light layer and the reason why I use hard light is because I can actually adjust the values at the same time. So using hard light you can actually desaturate and saturate at the same time as pushing a lighter or darker value which you can't do with a color layer. Right now I am using the dodge tool and the interesting thing with the dodge tool is you can actually select whether you work the shadows, the midtones, or the highlights. And if you work only in the shadows, it tends to build things up with a kind of a flat, uh, desaturated uh, finish. Obviously, with color, with black and white, it, it wouldn't affect the saturation. But uh, if I chose highlights as opposed to shadows, it it exaggerates the highest values, but the mid-tones actually, actually boost in saturation as well. So it's kind of, it's really effective, especially for this, to pull more color into the image at the same time as brightening it up. It's kind of similar to the hard light layer, but um, with me now having my image flattened down, it's just easy to use the dodge tool. I can switch to the burn tool, which it acts exactly the same, where I can choose my value range I want it to affect. Similar to having blending modes on new layers, you can also do it with the brush itself. So as you can see in the top left, I'm using colour at the moment and just pushing a little bit more saturation around the buffalo. I just used a colour balance to push and pull the the colours that I want. So I added a little bit more blue to the shadows, a little bit more red to the highlights. Then using um, select colour range, 
you can choose a color so I chose the pink hues that I have and then just uh, used hue saturation to push a little bit more red in there so it wasn't too vibrantly pink with the square marquee tool I just selected the left hand building and using command T or control T on PC I just dragged one of the anchor points to push the perspective a little bit more. A minor change, but uh, just to make it feel a little bit more natural. Using the colour blending mode on the brush, I'm just highlighting the trail that's going to be behind the buffalo and uh, using the dodge tool, give it a little burst of uh, saturation and brightness. Same for the, the neon, getting that implied. I'm now at the point where I'd like to add a little bit more texture to these foreground buildings and using some references I'm going to try and create my own texture. I, I could have just overlaid a photograph but with it having more of a painterly feel I thought it might be best to paint some up instead. The brush that I used for that base has a variation in values. That's because in the brush panel you can actually select um, color dynamics and on there you have the choice of pulling and pushing sliders for hue, saturation, um, brightness and it allows you to add more variation to the stroke. It could be you can either have it so you each individual brush stroke changes or you can have it where with one sweep it has a, ver a variation of changes throughout that, sh that brush stroke and that's what I did for this one. So it creates a nice uh, a nice texture base to work onto so that my final won't have any, any smooth areas and it adds more information and interest. I painted it in black and white so that I can overlay it. So I'm just trying to find a position now using the overlay blending mode for where I want the general masses to be. And I just just copy and pasted it to the other side so I can add a little bit of texture to the, the left hand side of the building too. And this is only to use as a base that I can now work on top of. Pick out the shapes. There's a there's gonna be a lot of happy accidents and it keeps it nice and organic. Although my beginning stages to the painting are quite methodical and they follow the similar process, the rest of the process is going to be a bit of a free-for-all. I move around the painting a lot, constantly picking small problems at a time and solving them individually as opposed to spending all my time rendering out one stage so the whole painting kind of builds up together. Touching on the colour dynamics again, for this stage using a colour blending mode again, I am adding more colour variations to the the empty spaces, like the, the buildings, they're quite monotonous so they've all got the same kind of colour tone, but using the colour dynamics I can throw in variations from purple, blues and greens all simultaneously so it gets more, more interest. And breaks up any spaces that look a little flat or uninteresting. In regards to lighting, the buildings themselves don't really have any directional light source. It's kind of taken on a lot of a lot of ambient lighting so underneath the the ledges of the buildings above I kind of rely more on ambient occlusion 
to get the sense of it being three-dimensional. Ambient occlusion is places that the light is hard to reach, like in cracks and crevices. The light bounces around a lot but can't quite get into those small and hard to reach places. So underneath ledges where there's not much directional lighting, it the, the light can't reach it quite as well. And I'm relying on that now to to strengthen the, the planes on the outside. By planes, I just mean the, the surfaces that are facing away from the building. So areas around like drain pipes and such, those aren't gonna be too different in value, but I make sure that if I darken the inside of the drain pipe where the light is a little bit harder to reach, then it will make it look a lot more three-dimensional. Although overall the painting does have a lot of contrast, like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of high values in the buffalo and in the neon, the area on the building in the foreground, the values are they're very similar, and I think in more cases than not, less is definitely more. You can show a lot of depth with very little value change, and in places like this where it's going to be not very well lit, it works very well just to keep keep those values separate but not too dissimilar and I think that's a really good way of getting those low value ranges to to communicate nicely with each other And like I did on the building before, I just copied and pasted my texture from earlier on and I'm going to just create a base mesh on the on the right hand building here to add a bit more interest. And this will be the same process where I, I'll merge it down and I'll start painting over the top. This building probably won't have as much detail as the other, just for the sake of it I don't want it to draw too much tension away. So as the image progresses further away from the buffalo, it probably will decrease in detail and contrast. The only area which I might push a little bit is the neon between the center gap because I want that to be a secondary focal point. When it comes to composition, there there are a lot of rules to learn. They're not mandatory, but also you can break the rules as well. But some of the things that I think are important to take consideration of is balance. Having things in a scene that can vary in uh, position and scale that works on some sort of harmonious level. So in this painting, for example, I went for the kind of standard rule of thirds like on the left hand side the streak of neon in the alleyway is relatively third in place and the buffalo is kind of a third within a third section of the entire canvas but also getting some sort of rhythm going so if you had um, if you had subjects in your in your painting no matter what it is that was all the same size all positioned evenly it would become very very unnatural um, having it spaced out further apart and varying in different sizes can make it feel a lot more organic and make it feel a lot more easy and pleasing to the eye Having things a little bit too structured, a little bit too organized can actually make the, the the viewer feel uncomfortable. And that's great if that was your intention. So if you want the, 
the if you want the viewer to feel at an unease looking at your painting then that's that's a very useful way of breaking that rule but in most cases if that's not the intention then it's good to get more variety I'm going to start adding some detail now to the floor below the buffalo and in the brush set there is a scatter brush which you'll be able to try out as well and it's kind of an organic uh, plant like brush and it has colour dynamics on it as well and I place kind of one stamp of that down and skew it to create the puddle shapes underneath and I just go over the top and paint in bits that I want, paint out bits that I don't want and then slowly bring the values down as it comes closer towards the the front of the painting and same as before I add the streaks below the the legs to look as though it's uh, reflecting in the water below over the top I am actually using a screen layer and screen layer works a little bit similar to hard light in the sense that it can push value and color at the same time though it cannot change it cannot make your painting darker it can only lighten but it's great for adding glow um, hard light color dodge linear dodge all these are really good for adding uh, nice vibrant glows I, I do often use a screen layer for this and I'm doing the same now for the plants in the alley uh, having them illuminate their surroundings and draw the, the streaks down into the wet floor Now that I have the lighting down for the, the plants, I'm just going to detail them up a little bit, make them look pretty, and try and get some of that light to bounce around the environment a little bit more, maybe touch on the walls a little bit. If ever you are in a position where your focal point doesn't doesn't have the readability that it needs, like it doesn't draw the attention that it deserves, uh, just stop and step back and review what it is in your painting that uh, is preventing that from happening. Maybe there's something else in the painting that's drawing too much attention, and this could be anything. But it's about getting some sort of contrast, and that could be through value changes or colour or uh, sharpness so it might be a case of you choose your focal point or focal points and then as you progress away from that focal point you can reduce the amount of contrast or you could um, ever so slightly desaturate the image or brush out edges or loosen up the amount of detail and 
any of these should help bring the the viewer's attention back to the main the main focal point. I, uh, I kind of wanted the the trail to maybe communicate a little bit more with its surroundings so I thought I'll have some of the plants growing up around the side of the, the posts just so that it's not kind of a boring line that just passes through but it's actually more involved with the rest of the environment. And now a part that I find really fun to do. So I'm going to be doing all the neon signs. I just, I love, I love neon. I love, I love glowing contrast. And because I'm working on one layer, I am just using a light-ish uh, color, drawing the streak, drawing the line that I want to use for the neon, and then using the dodge tool on highlight, I'm going over the neon and that's great to give that light value a punch straight up towards white and then the edges just have this burst of color absolutely perfect for neon you can do the same with uh, going over it with a color or linear dodge uh, brush or screen it does very similar so if you can't use the dodge tool with it being on a new layer by all means just create a new layer above that set it to a hard light color dodge linear dodge screen and go over it with a nice nice saturated color and it should do exactly the same Now that my neon base is down, I can put those lines back in that I had from the original sketch, either like telegraph lines or um, uh, clothes lines. 
and I think it's really good, especially when it's crossing paths with the neon. It's obvious that there's more depth to the painting and those are actually further back and pushing them back into the distance. So I think it's good to add a little bit more depth. Just break up that shape. Throughout the entire process, I have been consciously trying to make sure that there is a vertical motion going with the painting. So with the buildings themselves being tall and thin, it's helping keep that, that structure, but also the brush marks. I wanted that to follow the same suit. So from the very start, I would have these long brush strokes going up and down. It's just, just to help create this illusion of height and everything is this, it's this tall, long city. And now I'm just trying to continue with the idea of this life in these buildings. There are actually, you know, people inside. So here and there I'm, I'm adding little windows on, lights. I'm, I'm going to try not to make the lights too bright because I do I do want them to blend in still, I don't want to detract too much tension from the buffalo. But it'd be nice to add a little bit more interest and break up that very, uh, very similar value range and colour range. In the spirit of making these houses homes, I thought, well, maybe they'd want some little fairy lights up. Um, so, using the hard round brush and the brush tip shape settings, you push the spacing further across and it creates this nice little dotted effect. And it's perfect for doing these kind of details. To make sure that they they feel more connected to the environment. I just get some nice warm glow and have it touch the areas around it, so up the post, against the wall, the corrugated metal above, just so that it feels like it fits in, fits into the surroundings. Makes it just a little bit more natural.
it's a small detail, but I kind of thought that after the building it just looks like it goes off completely into oblivion. And I wanted to just imply that there was actually still more life ahead. So I just created these little electrical wires just going off into the, the smog just to imply that there is actually like a more world around. With a bit of feedback uh, from my friends here in the studio, they, they highlighted that maybe the attention wasn't, despite being very bright around the buffalo, it still wasn't drawing um, enough attention. So I started creating some directional arrows, things that could imply your eye to go that way. So just maybe alongside the building here, you can see that I'm going to add some little little touches, just little directional lines that can maybe help guide the eye into that direction. Subtle, but hopefully it can help. Just so that I can get a feeling that uh, this neon sign is more integrated into the environment, I'm just going to copy and paste it and stretch it against the wall next to it as though it's reflecting against the surface. Um, I'll erase little bits so it implies that the wall's not completely flat and then just gently uh, merge it into the, into the environment.
with a little bit more feedback from my friends. Um, they said that their eye was, despite being very bright in the corners, it, their eye still went straight to that middle house with the fairy lights. And it's probably because it was creating like this little frame, like this little square directly in the middle of the page. So I went back in and I took out the, the bar. How I did that so quickly was I used the spot heel brush. It's great for removing part of the environment and replacing with its surrounding. So with one, one sweep, it managed to delete the line and fill it, fill it with colors from its, uh, its closest neighboring values. I also, I really didn't, I wasn't feeling the shape of the, the veranda on the side of the building. Um, and in spirit of it being vertical, the whole piece being long and tall, I thought I would go for a, uh, some sort of signage, uh, like a lamppost or something along that lines. And I think it was, I think it works nicer as a shape than the, the triangular veranda that we had before. To try and get a little bit more of a, uh, a magical spiritual vibe to the buffalo and actually integrate it a little bit nicer into the environment, I thought about these little like uh, wisps um, coming from its feet with each step, as though it's like almost like a mist that feeds onto the environment, just to make it look a little bit more, a little bit more magical.
just trying to use the environment here again just to add more directional lines trying to get you to shift your attention towards the buffalo on the right just subtle indications Something that I like to do in my paintings quite a lot is playing with edge control and this is a great way of guiding the viewer to what you want them to see. So it's, it's, it's a common mistake to make all the edges clean and um, it becomes a little bit more confusing for the eye. So it, it does work easier if the value ranges are similar or the colour ranges are similar and you can just gently smudge, blur or blend those edges together and then it draws focus away from it and it leads the eye back into places that have a little bit more sharpness. So yeah, it's a great way of instructing the viewer's eye to, to an important area in the painting that you want them to see.
having took a step back, I realised that the whole painting had a kind of very side-on angle, and despite putting in quite a low horizon line, there wasn't that much in the way of perspective, so I thought I'd give it a little bit of a boost. I copied and pasted the, the buildings, and using free transform again, I just just skewed it the whole the whole image just just to get the idea that these buildings are actually a lot taller Okay, so I'm just going to cover a couple of the things that I talked about in the video, but in a little bit more detail so you can see how they work. Um, the first thing I'm going to touch on is the color dodge tool. So if I just draw uh, a line, that's going to be my neon, and I jump to the dodge tool. If I sweep over, you can see it boosts the value of the, the line itself and pushes the, the color as well. I just turned off protect tones because it allows you to um, push it a little bit further but that's that's perfect for neon changing value and color at the same time had I used dodge on shadow it would have been a completely different finish it it doesn't play with color at all <laughs> or very little and it's very yeah it's very desaturated so for this kind of work it wouldn't it wouldn't have suited neon. The midtones is very, very middle of the path. It works both high values and low values together, but still nowhere near as strong as what highlight can. And the burn tool is very similar. So if I choose highlight, it kind of does not touch the color very well. It desaturates as it darkens. Whereas if I chose shadow, you can see how it touches the shadows first and the mid-tones or the light tones actually increase in saturation. So they can both be very useful depending on where you use it. For color dynamics, this is something that I love to do um, at the start of my paintings more than anything. And it's great for adding variety in your color or value so that you have a strong base to work on and if you eye drop from the canvas it's always going to be something similar but ultimately different so you can constantly get new values and new colors as you're working and it won't look flat this is a process you can do at any point i first started doing it at the end of a painting when i thought that it was looking a little bit too smooth and airbrushed i would go back over and add variations in color and value so that it looked a little bit uh, there's there's more information in the empty spaces but I find that now I, I do it throughout the entire process anyway but if I can get a strong base then it solves a lot of a lot of trouble along the way so we have a few different brushes but you can do this with any brush you want this one for example or this you can see there's subtle variations in the color and value. So if you go to your brush panel and go to color dynamics, you can see that there's these little sliders. The more that you push and pull these sliders, the more that the uh, brush will respond. So if I push these all up, you can see there's some now major changes in the brush. If I turn off apply per tip, it becomes 
per brush stroke, which is also interesting to use, but you have less control because of it being so random. But just to show that it could be any brush, I'm going to choose your standard chalk brush and put Color Dynamics on. It does exactly the same. Ultimately, this brush looks pretty awful, but let's try just the round brush. It does exactly the same, or apply per tip. But I find if you just pull the hue, saturation, and brightness to a, a lower amount, then it creates subtle variations. So now if I turn off color dynamics, I can eye drop a whole range of colors and it keeps it nice and interesting to look at. Similar to this, you could apply it to the brush as normal, but then use it on a color layer. So if I wanted to add some variations in color, then I could just Let's push these up a little bit more. I can scatter some nice colors in over the top. And it's great. If you think you, your colors are looking a little bit flat, throw some of that down and it'll do the trick. Edge control. There are so many ways that this can be done. Um, one of my preferred methods, let's say this area is too sharp. Let's actually make it sharper and I wanted to break this up a little bit. I could either paint the edge out and make it less defined, use the values around next to each other and pull them close together. So now it draws focus away from it. As well as that, you could use your smudge tool and you can blend edges out or using using a scatter brush I think this is the right one yeah you can do exactly the same you can just let's get back to the sharper edge you can blur the edge out if you feel like it's too smooth you could always just go back in and paint some of the wall back in. I find that if you have a sharp edge against a nice gradient, it's really, it's just aesthetically pleasing. It's a nice balance. So you'll have a value that gets darker towards the edge as a nice smooth gradient than a sharp clean edge and it separates it, separates it really nicely.